Hello, everyone. This is number four in my new YouTube series dealing with interpretations of Bible prophecy through the ages from ancient right up to modern times. And as I've explained before, when I say Bible, I mean the Hebrew Bible that Christians call the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. I want to cover the wide range of interpretations, primarily among Christians and Jews uh, throughout history. So today, we're going to dive into the weeds, a little bit of history. I'm hoping I've got enough YouTube followers and subscribers and viewers and listeners who want to dig deep and get out their own Bibles and, and study a little bit. And I know some of you have studied these texts uh, over the years and might be pretty familiar with them, but I, I really think many, many people today are not. And as we're going to see as we get on through this series, particularly into the modern world, uh, these texts continue to have a tremendous influence, even a geopolitical influence. And so it, this, this topic is not just an arcane ancient historical kind of thing. I mean, the Bible continues to be used by people at every level of our culture, from the very top on down to the common person reading their own Bible. So we started the book of Daniel last time, number three. This is number four. And I covered Daniel two and seven. We're doing dreams and visions of Daniel. And today I want to go into chapter eight where you have this single vision that Daniel had. It's very detailed, but the interpretation is transparent. It's given within the prophecy itself. However, there's a problem because it constantly says it's the time of the end, the time of the end. And what is predicted to happen, if you just take a straight historical reading, happened long, long ago, and here we are still waiting for the time of the end. And we'll talk about how people deal with that. And that would be both Jews and Christians who consider the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament or both to be the inspired word of God. So let me call the slides up. What we did last time, I'm not going to review it in any detail, but this sort of builds. So uh, if you didn't watch number three, and you're watching this one, you don't need to stop the video. You can listen to it, of course. It's a free country, as we say. But I really encourage you to go back and get the details. So uh, we're talking about chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, and then 11 through 12. This visionary material of Daniel, some dreams, some visions, some interpreted, some not, are just foundational to all interpretations of biblical prophecy through the ages. And as I mentioned in the previous episode, the book of Revelation, which Christians look to as sort of the final word on Bible prophecy, it ends with Jesus saying, I'm coming soon, surely I come quickly. Uh, it's largely built on the book of Daniel. It's a Christianized interpretation of Daniel, but it has earlier layers that I've reconstructed, and we will look at that in this series as we get further along, that are absolutely Jewish and not Christian at all, but it's very much based on the book of Daniel. So Daniel is fundamental. Now, the first vision of Daniel in chapter 2, I'm not going to go over the text again, was a statue with these four kingdoms. And the clear historical interpretation is the gold is Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. The silver is Cyrus, the great Medo-Persia, the Persian empire that conquered the Babylonians. So one is conquering the other successively. And the third is brass, Alexander and Macedonia, who of course defeats the Persians. You know the famous story of Alexander's battle with the Persians, if you've read any ancient history. And then a fourth kingdom, different from the others, and it has uh, ten horns and a little horn that speaks, actually. And historians universally agree that that is Antiochus IV, 
uh, his dates are around 168 to down to say 164. He's the figure that was behind the attempt to literally blot out Judaism as a religion in the second century BCE. He wasn't very successful. And if you've heard of the Maccabees, it's a celebration of the Jewish victory over the forces of Antiochus, also called Antiochus Epiphanes. So we went through that and talked about that. And again, uh, now, since the end did not come, unless you understand that the end came in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, there's an attempt over history to stretch this out. So you get the fourth kingdom interpreted later as Rome, and that's what we find in the New Testament. That's what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's as though we're moving on down through time, but these legs are going to get pretty long. And if you do think, as in this next illustration, that these legs have to reach all the way to the end of the age, and if you believe we're maybe in the end of the age, then you've got to look for kingdoms way past Rome, and the ten toes become kingdoms, and that could be the United Nations, some have said the United States of America, different kinds of unions in Africa, or the uh, European Union, that's a popular choice today. So you see how this becomes all of world history rather than the historical view, which would be Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, if you take this view, and I'm going to get ahead of myself just a bit here, what you've got, that little horn that persecutes uh, God's people, they're called the saints of the Most High, and then they finally defeat that little horn or that force or that power. If that little horn was not Antiochus Epiphanes, then you keep pushing it forward. And that's where Christians particularly, and some Jews, begin to talk about a final evil ruler before the end of the age. So you, you see Antiochus Epiphanes is more of a type of the final evil ruler. He would be an example of what such a one would be like. But then down through history, you have countless despots and evil rulers that have stirred people up. And once you're lengthening these legs and feet to go through time without end, like a stretching a rubber band, then that becomes an image of all the world kingdoms of world history. And when you get to the end of the age, whenever that happens to be, you're you're, you're in this period of corruption because this is iron mixed with clay, if you remember, okay? So, and then in chapter seven, it's a similar vision, but this time it's four animals, a lion, which is Babylon, and a bear, which is Persia. So you see the same idea, a leopard with four heads, and that would be Alexander the Great in the Greek empire. And when Alexander died, it was divided into four and depending on how you interpret the fourth kingdom, it becomes more than Antiochus Epiphanes. This would then be Rome, but then Rome could continue down to the end of time, even though Rome officially fell, we usually say, the Roman Empire in uh, 476 AD. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and look at the next one. There's a final picture with some more illustrations of these beasts. Uh, so I love this stuff. Now, here's chapter eight. Daniel has a vision of a ram and a male goat. It's called traditionally a he goat. So here you've got a picture of it. Here's the ram and here's the he goat. But the he goat has this huge horn that grows out of its head. Okay, this single horn. So we don't have to guess what that is or who that is because this vision is actually interpreted. Let's look at the vision first. So let's start with the ram. This is Daniel writing. He's in a visionary state. He's seeing these things and he's writing down what he sees. I raised my eyes and saw and behold a ram standing on the bank of the river. So he's in Babylon, according to the text. Daniel writes the text, the text claims, and when we finish this section on Daniel, we'll talk about that. Who was Daniel? 
who really wrote the book? Did Daniel write it in the time of Babylon and predict all these things? Or was it written later by someone in the name of Daniel or whatever? But now let's just take it as we read it. So he sees this ram on the banks of the river and it had two horns and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. So these are the different kings of Persia as it's interpreted, but we'll see in a minute. And I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward, and no beast could stand before him. Beasts would be other kingdoms, other powers, political and military powers. And there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and he magnified himself. If you know something about Cyrus, the king of Persia, who's clearly the higher of the horns, uh, he's able to basically conquer the known ancient Near Eastern world. So that's the, the ram. It's not interpreted here, but we'll get to it. And then you got the he goat. So here's a really bloody scene. And as I was considering, behold, a he goat came from the West. So this is from the Mediterranean. We're talking about the Persian empire. So you're coming from the West across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, meaning this animal is running so fast that the feet don't even touch the ground like a cheetah or a leopard racing through the Serengeti. And this goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. He came to the ram with two horns, which I'd seen standing on the bank of the river, and he ran at him in his mighty wrath. And I saw him come close to the ram and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him. And he cast him down to the ground and trampled upon him. And so here we have him puncturing uh, the ram and basically killing him and just walking all over him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Okay, so let's go on. Don't you love this stuff? Okay, then the he-goat, now that he's conquered the ram, he magnifies himself exceedingly. So he begins to really grow. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So whoever is represented, these horns are usually rulers or kingdoms. Uh, the great horn is broken. I think you've probably already guessed somebody named Alexander the Great, but let's wait and see. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So the great horn that conquered the ram is broken, and up come these four horns, and they would be north, south, east, and west of his central area of conquering. Okay? So it divided into four. The four horns replaced the broken one. Now... Then something else happens. A little horn comes out of one of the four horns. So we've got these four horns. I'm going to go back and just go ahead and say, these are the four divisions of Alexander the Great's kingdom. And we've got the Seleucids and the Ptolemies that really last the longest. These two get kind of knocked out. But out of the Seleucids comes the little horn, as we'll see. And out of one of the four came this little horn. Now remember, there was a little horn in Daniel 7. And what did that little horn do? He persecuted God's people. He changed times and laws. And he instituted this tremendous persecution. All historians that study this believe it's a reference to Antiochus Epiphanes. But he's not named here. He grew exceedingly great toward the south and the east in the glorious land. That's the Holy Land. So he conquers the Holy Land. It grew great even to the host of heaven and some of the host of the stars it cast down to the ground. Now, the idea in Daniel is that these angelic beings rule the various kingdoms of the world. And so when you conquer a kingdom, it's as if their angel or guardian loses power and falls from heaven, even to the prince of the host. Now, the prince of the host is the prince over Israel. We'll see who that is later. So he actually goes into the glorious land, the holy land, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, as the Romans later called it. 
And so what happens? He goes up against the prince of the host and the continual burnt offering was taken away from him. This would be from the people of Israel who are ruled by this prince of the host. Host means an army. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. Well, the sanctuary is the Jewish temple. It was rebuilt in 515. And the Jews came back, uh, a beachhead number of the Jews, we think maybe around 50,000, according to some of the records in the Bible, came back and they rebuilt the temple under uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and some of the people that you read about in those books of Nehemiah and Ezra in the Hebrew Bible. So there's a temple called the sanctuary and it's overthrown and the host was given over to it together with the continual burnt offerings through transgression and truth was cast to the ground and the horn acted and prospered. Then uh, the question is how long if the horn is going to conquer and stop temple worship, stop the daily sacrifice and pollute the temple, the sanctuary and take it over, how long? And then I heard a holy one speaking. So he's having this vision, but these angelic beings are appearing to him. And another holy one said to that one. So it's like these two beings are talking and Daniel's listening. So the one that knows is asked by the one that doesn't know. For how long is the vision concerning the continual burnt offering? There's sacrifices being stopped in the temple. And the transgression that makes desolate some sort of horrible thing that's done in the temple that causes desolation and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Remember the Jewish temple is very holy. There's a section in the outer courts for the Gentiles or non-Jews. But then finally, as you get closer and closer inside, it, it becomes more and more holy. And finally, the holy of holies that only the high priest can go in. Well, this is picturing that being all defiled. And the question is, how long? And the one who knows says to the one who asks, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Now, that's 2,300 evenings and mornings. That could be taken as 2,300 days. An evening and a morning is a day. Another evening and a morning is a day, or it could be two a day, and you would split it, which would give you 1150 days. Okay, so hold that thought. How long is it going to get trampled and defiled by this uh, he goat and his successor, the little horn? Now, when we get the interpretation, and it, it's in Daniel 8, you can just keep reading. I didn't put it all in here, but I'm going to summarize it. Before you get it, son of man, that's Daniel. He's called, O oh, son of man. The vision is for the time of the end. Now, this is where we get into the problem. Because if it's going to refer to Antiochus Epiphanes, nobody thinks that was the end of the age or even the end of Jewish history or anything of that sort. I mean, the Romans came in and did much more than Alexander the Great had ever done, or even Antiochus Epiphanes, his successor, the Little Horn. And yet, if you read Time of the End the way, say, Paul read it, Paul says the appointed time of the end has grown very short. And we know the Apostle Paul in the New Testament is reading this very passage in Daniel 8, and he thinks he's seeing a future fulfillment in his own time, as he talks about it. And then in verse 19, it's even more explicit. Behold, I will make known to you what shall be in the latter end of the indignation, this anger that Gentiles have against the Jewish people, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Again, see the problem. The author claims to be in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, right? King of Babylon, that first kingdom. Well, Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem in 586, 7, 8 BCE, let's say 587. So from the standpoint of the author, as he's being situated in the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, it's going to be 
a long time in the future from his time. After all, Antiochus Epiphanes is the second century BCE and Nebuchadnezzar is the sixth century BCE. Do the math. So the vision, the character Daniel is getting in this book, if he's in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, is looking ahead, what, 400 years until the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, okay? So here's the rest of the interpretation. We're simply told the two-horned ram is the king of Persia. So we know that that's basically Cyrus and his successors. Darius is the one that Alexander defeats. The he-goat is the king of Greece. The first horn that is the great horn is obviously Alexander, has to be. And then the four horns, what happened when Alexander died? His kingdom was divided into those four sectors, north, south, east, and west. Okay. Then we read that in the latter end of their rule, when the transgressors have reached their full measure, so this is basically saying at the end of the age, when these world kingdoms, and in this case, the ram and the he-goat, which are towards the end, that would be the iron and the feet of clay in the other vision, or the fourth beast in chapter 7, uh, there's going to be a king of bold countenance that's going to arise. He will understand riddles. His power will be great. He will cause fearful destruction. And he will succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people of the saints. That's a reference usually to the Jewish people, the Hebrew people that are living in this time. And by his cunning, he will make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall magnify himself. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall rise up even against the prince of princes which is essentially the either God himself by extension, but probably Michael, the prince of the people, as he's called in chapter 12, the great prince that rules over the people of Israel. But then it says, here's what's going to happen to him, by no human hand he'll be broken. So God is going to suddenly smash him, it sounds like, or maybe the prince of princes, the vision of the evenings and the mornings, that's that 2300 days, which has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it pertains to many days hence. Again, Daniel, the author, said in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to have to go from what, the sixth century to the fifth, to the fourth, to the third, to the second, to get to when this is supposed to happen. So, so far, I mean, if the end had come in the time of Antiochus, we, I guess, wouldn't be here and wouldn't be talking about this. So what did happen? Here's the historical interpretation that 99.99 critical historical scholars of the Hebrew Bible would take. In other words, they would not believe that the book of Daniel was written in the time of Nebuchadnezzar by a captive from the Jewish captivity of 587, 588 BCE, when that first temple was destroyed and the Jews were taken captive into Babylon. So there's this general agreement that we're talking about the period of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. I put one of his coins here. Here he is, uh, could very well look like him. He looks like a handsome Greek man with the garland on. But on the back is Zeus sitting on his throne holding Nike, the goddess of victory. And the inscription says, King Antiochus, God manifests. That's why he's called Epiphanes, bearing victory. So he's the manifestation of Zeus. Uh, and he erects this desolating sacrilege on the altar. And his persecution last 2300 mornings and evenings or 1150 days 3.5 years 168 to 164 and then the temple or the sanctuary is to be restored so i've got a bible here and i it has the apocrypha so i'm going to go to first maccabees and i want to read you a little bit just kind of skim through 
because if you're not familiar with the horrors of the Maccabean persecution, let me turn my light on here, it's well worth reading because it's pretty substantial. And many scholars would say it's probably exaggerated because it's written from the Jewish side of things. But anyway, in chapter 1, verse 20, after subduing Egypt, Antiochus returned, and this would be in 169, and he went up into Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. And he entered arrogantly the sanctuary. So he enters the temple of God that no one is allowed in except once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and that's the high priest. And he goes in arrogantly. We've got all kinds of legends. And he took the golden altar and the lampstand and all its utensils and the table of the bread of the presence and the cups and the bowls and the censers, the curtains. He basically just sacks the temple. He goes in, he takes everything in the temple, he just strips it, and he takes all these treasures and takes them back to his own land, okay? And then time goes on, and the sanctuary becomes desolate as a desert. What he then does uh, in the year 167, a bit later, is he sends out a message to all the peoples of his kingdom that he wants to say, ecumene, a one world kingdom where everybody worships the Greek gods. Everybody looks to Zeus, which is his patron deity. And he says that all the Gentiles and all the people of the kingdom must only sacrifice to the Greek gods. So after he takes all these treasures back to his own land, the temple is just devastated and desolate. There's nothing left. All activity ceases. He then goes back to Jerusalem. He burns down houses and tears down walls, and he seizes captive women and children and animals. He goes back to the temple where the altar was that had once been to God, the God of the Jews, Jehovah or Yahweh, and he erects a desolating sacrilege on the altar, probably a statue of Zeus, I would think. And then the books of the Torah were gathered up and torn to pieces and burnt with fire. And then they began to offer sacrifices on the altar to Zeus and the various pagan gods. Women were forbidden to circumcise their children. It's basically a de-Judaizing of the Jewish people. You can't follow your religion anymore. We're burning your books. Your temple is gone. And if your God was so powerful, why would he have allowed this? Well, you can see how Daniel is going to be a very important book during this time, whoever wrote it, because it would serve for people who believe it as a prediction of what was going to happen. And you would think then that the time of the end is very near. Even though you go through this devastating time, the prophecy says that the time of the end is near. And it's the full end of the indignation or the anger of Gentile people. So what happened? One priestly family that lived in Modin, which is very near Jerusalem. I've been there many times. I have friends that live there today. His name was Matthias. And he had five different sons, uh, Jonathan, Simon, Judas, Eleazar, and one just named John. And these are the Maccabee boys. And they put out a call to arms and they headed for the desert out by the Dead Sea. And they began to gather together people to fight against the forces of Antiochus. And... From the time that the temple had been defiled with this desolating sacrilege, which was 168 or so, maybe into 167, uh, by 164, they had defeated the forces of Antiochus Epiphanes. Guerrilla warfare, it's described as you go on through the book, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And then when you get to chapter 4, you get the account of how they were able to restore the sanctuary. And that's exactly what the prophecy says. So they rebuilt everything. Uh, they built the temple back. They built a new altar, 
uh, lampstand, altar of incense, the table, and so forth, and they lit the lamp. And the legend is that once they began sacrificing to God, when they lit this lamp, that it burned for eight days without running out of oil. And that's Hanukkah. You burn your candles for eight days and you celebrate the victory of the Maccabees and Jews do it to this day. And it's a time of rejoicing and celebration because God saved the Jewish people. Now, what should have happened, according to the book of Daniel, go back to chapter two, chapter seven, and now this chapter is the God of heaven should have set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed and break in pieces all the kingdoms of the world and fill the earth and stand forever. But that didn't happen. What happened is there was a brief period of Jewish independence, an independent Jewish state that had to deal with Rome. These are these Maccabean rulers you've heard of, Alexander, Janaeus, and John Hyrcanus, and so forth. They're all from that Maccabee family. They're descendants. They're priests, and later even rule as kings. And yet, uh, in 63, the Romans come in. So their period of independence only lasted 100 years. And then the Romans come in and take over totally. And they have complete control all the way into the first and second and third and fourth and fifth centuries. That gets us even in the time past Constantine, who became a Christian. But that gets us way ahead of this story. But the point is, it was not the end of the age. Now, you can see we're facing a problem here. Because if everything should have ended with the defeat of Antiochus Epiphanes, and it didn't, you've either got to throw it out and say, well, you know, these were the speculations of people in that time who were very persecuted, and they were dreaming of God sending redemption, and he would break in pieces that final kingdom, and he would defeat the he goat and so forth in, in the case of this vision and the kingdom of God would come and stand forever. So if you don't go with that because it didn't happen, you got to have a replay. If the Bible is true, you got to have a replay if you're going to take it literally. So that means in the future, there needs to be a temple. There needs to be sacrifices. You need to get an outside ruler coming from the west and then down from the north. And he needs to invade Jerusalem and take over the temple. And this is the one that Jews and Christians often call the Antichrist, which doesn't necessarily just mean he's against Christ, but the one instead of Christ, the flip side of the Messiah or Christ. Christians think it's Jesus. Jews are still waiting for this one to come. But either way, it's not a great future because before the Messiah finally comes, you've got to have this terrible time of trouble once again. So it's like the Maccabean tragedy and suffering was not enough. It was just a dim foreshadowing of this final evil ruler who really will come at the end of the age. Now, let's go on. Let's take two modern interpretations that I think you'll find quite interesting. They're both from the 19th century of our own time, the 1800s. William Miller, a Baptist preacher, uh, he studied prophecies of the Bible for years. He became convinced that he had it all figured out. And what he did, you can see in this chart, he took the 70 weeks prophecy that's going to be in Daniel 9, the next chapter. So what he does is he begins the 490 year period that we'll cover next time and the 2300 days with the date 457 BC. And he finds that date in the book of Ezra chapter 7 under the Persian king Artaxerxes. Ezra goes up to Jerusalem and what the prophecy in Daniel 9 says is there'll be a command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. 
so this is after the Babylonian destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that we started with. This is down into the Persian period, the second kingdom, and it's under a Persian king whose name was Artaxerxes. And he does give the decree, go back and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So Miller interprets these 2300 days as years, as you can see here. And he bases that on the book of Ezekiel in chapter 5, I've got it here, in which Ezekiel's told to lie on his side for 40 days and then for 390 days, and that will be a day for a year. So a day in prophecy, in a prophecy like this, is really a year. So it's 2,300 years. So what did he do? He just added 2,300 years to 457 BC. You add your dates together, and he came out with 1844. Now, his first date was 1843, and then he figured out you got to add a one. So it's actually 2,301 because there's no year zero. So when you move from BC to CE and add the dates together, you've got to add that one. At first, for months and months, he was preaching 1843, the time of the end. That's going to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he, of course, was a Christian. And then when it didn't happen, he said, oh, I forgot. Uh, I got to add a year. It's 1844. That'll be 2,300 years. If you literally counted it out, that's how it would come from 457 B.C. And guess what happened? Well, we're here, so nothing happened. And that's called the Great Disappointment. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists came out of and developed out of the Millerite movement, this Great Disappointment. And their leader, Ellen G. White, began to have visions and dreams herself about this date. And she was told in her visions that the date was correct that it doesn't mean the visible coming of Jesus to the earth. It has to do with Jesus in heaven, atoning for the sins of mankind in the heavenly temple, and now he's left the sanctuary. Remember the prophecy says, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. There's all the sins of humankind will be atoned for, and now he's left the sanctuary. And of course, they thought that his visible return would be very soon in their own lifetime. And time went on and time went on, and the Adventists still hold this view that something very cosmically significant happened in 1844. I cover all of this history in a book I wrote called Why Waco? As some of you know, David Koresh, Waco, Texas, 1993, and the terrible tragedy with the Branch Davidians, they're a breakoff group from the Seventh-day Adventists. And in my book, Why Waco, I spend several chapters explaining all of these interpretations and how it finally led even to David Koresh. So I spent a lot of time uh, working these calculations out and trying to understand them and why people would believe them. So there's still people that would say 1844 was correct. That was when the sanctuary was cleansed. However, a more literal interpretation was given by Adam Clark, and this is just mind-blowing, and I'm going to tell you a personal story about it, about my father. Adam Clark is a 19th century, early 19th century scholar, and he wrote a five-volume commentary on the entire Bible. I have a set of all five volumes that was in my family, and when my father died, they were passed on to me. He takes very much of a kind of a preterist view, meaning a lot of it has happened, but when he gets to prophecies like this, he can't take a preterist view because he would be saying that it was Antiochus Epiphanes, it was already fulfilled, and then the end didn't come. Because that language about the appointed time of the end seems to be the end of the age. You know, in others, you read Daniel 2 with Daniel 7 and with Daniel 8, and when those kingdoms are destroyed at the end, the kingdom of God is set up and fills the whole earth and all the other kingdoms are broken in pieces. Well, obviously, uh, Rome wasn't broken in pieces at that time. And so uh, what are you going to do? So anyway, Adam Clark interprets it 
historically, and he says unto, he, here he's quoting verse 14 of Daniel 8, unto 2,300 days, though literally it be 2,300 evenings and mornings, yet I think the prophetic day should be understood here as in other parts of this prophet must signify so many years. If we date these years from the vision of the he-goat, Alexander invading Asia and defeating Darius the Persian, Darius II. Now, get this, Adam Clark is writing this in 1825. I got to give him credit because most interpreters of the Bible and of its prophecies, they like to make it come out in their own time as far as when is the end is coming. So he does the math, and he says, well, once the he-goat is broken, that was the beginning of the end. Yes, it was Antiochus Epiphanes, but essentially Antiochus Epiphanes is a successor of the Greek kingdom, which is in effect putting Jerusalem under Gentile reign, except for the brief period of the Maccabees it has been there until when? So he adds 2,300 years to his uh, 334, and he comes up with 1966. And what the prophecy says is in 2300 mornings and evenings, which he takes to be years, the sanctuary will be vindicated, is actually the word, not cleansed, vindicated. That is, it'll be retaken from pagans. Now, he made the same mistake that Miller did. When you go from BC and add a number, to get to an AD or a CE date, you've got to add a year. And that comes out to 1967. Now, some people have even worked with when Alexander entered into Asia, and they come out with June of 334. And some of you will know June of 1967, we've got to add a year, is a six-day war when Jews for the first time since the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 had sovereignty and military control once more over the city of Jerusalem. Now you talk about firing up Bible prophecy. We're going to get to that later. What happened after 1967? You got Hal Lindsey rushing out a book, the late great planet earth and all kinds of interpretations about the Jewish temple being rebuilt and Christians supporting Zionism because they want to help the Jews to build the temple. They've even donated millions of dollars to Orthodox Jews who don't even believe in Christ to rebuild the temple. And as you know, that's the hottest piece of real estate on the planet and has been for quite a while. So here's the story. My father was somewhat of a preterist mixed with the futurist. He was a conservative Christian. He did believe in the second coming of Christ and so forth. But he still thought that many of these prophecies were fulfilled in a preliminary way, at least with Antiochus Epiphanes. So he had his Adam Clark commentary and he read Daniel 8 and he wrote in the margin. I still have it in my library when he got to this right here, 1966, and he was probably writing it in 1963. So who could predict in uh, four years, the Jews would have Jerusalem under their sovereignty again. And he wrote in the margin in his own handwriting, I still have it, no way. And there's no way is this going to get fulfilled in 1966, which is really, as I said, 1967. Uh, he did live to see that happen. I don't know if he changed his mind on it. So well, that's chapter eight. Uh, this is going to build as we go. So we got chapter two, the statue, chapter seven, the four beasts. Now chapter eight, zooming in on the Persian and Greek wars and the successors of Alexander and Antiochus Epiphanes. So, so far you could read these as basically being fulfilled in 164 BC with Antiochus Epiphanes, God made manifested, except 
the prophecies talk about the time of the end and the kingdom of God being set up and breaking in pieces all the kingdoms and standing forever and filling the earth and so forth. And certainly that would involve presumably the Messiah coming. So next time we will go further, we're going to go into Daniel 9, probably the most overinterpreted and intriguing prophecy in the entire Bible, because it talks about a final period of 490 years, and then it talks about the destruction of the sanctuary in the city. Now, if you go along with what we've been reading, it seems like that would be Antiochus Epiphanes again that all these prophecies keep coming down to him. But wait, I look forward to covering that with you. And it's going to accumulate as we go on, so stay with me. If you've never studied these things, uh, get out a Bible, uh, read the prophecies, mark them, underline them, because we're going to be coming back to those many times as we see how people have interpreted them. Take care, everyone.